46 New Testament Dispensational Ages Inside of Time The previous chapter covered the first 4,000 plus years of human history. Our study has shown that the Old Testament can be divided into five dispensational ages. Within that period, one could make the case for extra or lesser number of dispensations. For instance, some might contend that the law transitioned into an age identified as the Age of Prophets, or the Age of Law and Prophets. Others would include as dispensations the dispensations outside of time and eternity. Yet, not every variation influenced by one's opinion is worthy of a fight or further division amongst believers. Dispensationalism possesses certain elements over which one should contend while many of the variations could be attributed to differences in opinion or perspective. Regardless of one's position, grace could certainly be extended toward those with whom we differ on the number of dispensations. While these studies are intriguing and hopefully quite insightful, the Bible never specifically identifies a set number of dispensations. Most teachers have historically considered seven basic dispensations without considering the next one addressed in this work. Our study of dispensational ages now transitions into the New Testament. The new chart designates the final three dispensational ages that fall within the bounds of time. It is important to recognize that the sixth dispensation is split into two parts one before the age of the church and one after it. This interruption in the sixth age is purely from man's perspective as a parenthetically inserted age known as the church age. God did not view the age of the church as parenthetical. To him, the church age was never a parenthetical afterthought as the presumed plan B should Israel unexpectedly reject his son. God knew of his plan for the church from the beginning, yet the progressive revelation of his will makes the church age appear to man as an optional period. Plainly, the Jews' rejection of the Messiah did not catch the omniscient God, who declares the end from the beginning, off guard. Isaiah 46, 9 Remember the former things of old, for I am God, and there is none else, I am God, and there is none like me. 10 Declaring the end from the beginning, and from ancient times the things that are not yet done, saying, My counsel shall stand, and I will do all my pleasure. 6. The Age of Readiness, the Gospels, the first of these New Testament dispensations is the Age of Readiness. This age begins with John the Baptist. 1. The opening event the ministry of John the Baptist the Age of Readiness lasts between 30. 2 and 1, half years and 30, 3 and 1, half years. The Old Testament scriptures prophesied the incarnation and ministry of Christ. In addition to that, the scripture promised one who would precede Christ's ministry to prepare the way for him. John the Baptist is this promised messenger or voice, as identified by scripture. Isaiah 40, 1 Comfort yet, comfort ye my people, saith your God. To speak ye comfortably to Jerusalem, and cry unto her, that her warfare is accomplished, that her iniquity is pardoned, for she hath received of the Lord's hand double for all her sins. 3. The voice of him that crieth in the wilderness, Prepare ye the way of the Lord, make straight in the desert a highway for our God. 4. Every valley shall be exalted, and every mountain and hill shall be made low, and the crooked shall be made straight and the rough place is plain, five and the glory of the Lord shall be revealed, and all flesh shall see it together, for the mouth of the Lord hath spoken it. Malachi 3, 1 Behold, I will send my messenger, and he shall prepare the way before me, and the Lord, whom ye seek, shall suddenly come to his temple, even the messenger of the covenant, whom ye delight in, behold, he shall come, saith the Lord of hosts. Undeniably. These scriptures were, at least in part, pointing to and fulfilled by John the Baptist. For instance, Matthew plainly points to John fulfilling Isaiah's prophecy, for this John the Baptist is he that was spoken of by the prophet Esaias, saying, The voice of one crying in the wilderness, Prepare ye the way of the Lord, make his path straight, Matthew 3, 3. Pertaining to Malachi's prophecy, Mark wrote of John the Baptist, as it is written in the prophets, Behold, I send my messenger before thy face, which shall prepare thy way before thee. Additionally, 
In Isaiah's prophecy, John was described as the voice of one crying in the wilderness, Prepare ye the way of the Lord, make his path straight, Mark 1, 2-3. John's ministry as the voice preparing the way of the Lord began while in his mother Elizabeth's womb. Quite remarkably, John the Baptist was filled with the Holy Ghost, even from his mother's womb, Luke 1, 15. In fact, John leaped for joy in Elizabeth's womb when the newly conceived Jesus still in the womb came into the presence of John and Elizabeth, Luke 1, 41, 44. Just over 30 years later, John began his public ministry of preparing the way for the Messiah. He went forth preaching in the wilderness of Judea, and saying, Repent yet, for the kingdom of heaven is at hand, Matthew 3, 1-2. John's ministry was quite the spectacle as the people went out to him Jerusalem, and all Judea, and all the region round about Jordan, and were baptized of him in Jordan, confessing their sins, Matthew 3, 5-6. One day, when questioned as to whether John was the Christ, John answered them, saying, I baptize with water, but there standeth one among you, whom ye know not, he it is, who coming after me is preferred before me whose shoes latch it I am not worthy to unloose, John 1, 26-27. The next day John seeth Jesus coming unto him, and saith, Behold the Lamb of God, which taketh away the sin of the world. This is he of whom I said, After me cometh a man which is preferred before me, for he was before me. And I knew him not, but that he should be made manifest to Israel, therefore am I come baptizing with water. John 1, 29-31 John's rise to prominence was certainly God, ordained, but as the Lord's earthly ministry began to blossom, at 30 years of age Luke 3, 23, John's mission was ending. Of course, man, the Pharisees in particular, dwelt on the external comparisons and pointed out that Jesus made and baptized more disciples than John, John 4, 1. Even John's disciples grew concerned about the shift to Jesus in prominence. John responded to their concerns stating that his diminishing influence was God, ordained, a man can receive nothing, except it be given him from heaven. Ye yourselves bear me witness, that I said, I am not the Christ, but that I am sent before him. He that hath the bride is the bridegroom, but the friend of the bridegroom, which standeth and heareth him, Rejoiceth greatly because of the bridegroom's voice, this my joy therefore is fulfilled. He must increase, but I must decrease, John 3, 27-30. John fulfilled his mission well. Yet, his bold stand against ungodliness ultimately caused his imprisonment, Mark 6, 17-18. For a time while John remained in prison, Fear of John's power with God and the convicting power of John's message kept him alive, Mark 6, 19-20. During this time, John sent messengers to Jesus asking, Art thou he that should come, or do we look for another? Matthew 11, 3. Jesus not only responded in the affirmative, but as John's messengers departed, Jesus began to say unto the multitudes concerning John, What went ye out for to see? A prophet? Yet, yeah, I say unto you, and more than a prophet. For this is he, of whom it is written, Behold, I send my messenger before thy face, which shall prepare thy way before thee. Verily I say unto you, among them that are born of women there hath not risen a greater than John the Baptist, notwithstanding he that is least in the kingdom of heaven is greater than he. Matthew 11, 7-11 when John's voice from that prison cell was finally and completely silenced, Jesus began his message where John's message ended preaching the gospel of the kingdom of God, Mark 1, 14. John's mission in life soon ended in a dirty deal made by a dancing girl asking for John's head in a charger, Matthew 14, 6-11. After his beheading, John's disciples came, and took up the body, and buried it and went and told Jesus, Matthew 14, 12. Jesus responded by departing thence by ship into a desert place apart, Matthew 14, 13. 2. 
Dispensational continuity Several characteristics true in previous ages continued into this age. For instance, God still worked through man's conscience. Jesus' dealings with men showed times when men heard Christ's words and were convicted by their own conscience, John 8, 9. Additionally, some of the principles set forth in the age of government continued as conveyed by Christ's position on capital punishment, Matthew 15, 3 to 4. Lastly, we find that the ministry of the Lord Jesus Christ did not terminate the law but renewed and expanded its emphasis and fulfilled its requirements. Matthew 5, 17 Think not that I am come to destroy the law, or the prophets, I am not come to destroy, but to fulfill. 18 For verily I say unto you, till heaven and earth pass, one jot or one tittle shall in no wise pass from the law, till all be fulfilled. 19 Whosoever therefore shall break one of these least commandments, and shall teach men so, he shall be called the least in the kingdom of heaven, but whosoever. Whosoever shall do and teach them, the same shall be called great in the kingdom of heaven. 20 For I say unto you, that except your righteousness shall exceed the righteousness of the scribes and Pharisees, ye shall in no case enter into the kingdom of heaven. 3. The necessity of faith like in all past ages, it is important to understand the importance of faith and the object of one's faith during this age. Yet, this age needs some particular attention. To understand the object of one's faith, two preliminary truths must be recognized. 1. Men prior to the cross did not put their faith in the finished work of Christ on the cross for their salvation, and, 2. The gospel preached during this time was the gospel of the kingdom. Matthew 4, 23. Unfortunately, these two points have created mass hysteria amongst some Bible preachers accustomed to thinking that the disciples were saved by believing in the death, burial, and resurrection. Yet, a few scriptures disprove these unfortunate teachings. John the Baptist alluded to the benefit of the death, burial, and resurrection when he said, Behold the Lamb of God, which taketh away the sin of the world. Yet, John's preaching never expressed how Christ would accomplish taking away the sin of the world. Additionally, Jesus' earthly ministry began when he was age 30. Yet, even then, he did not immediately begin preaching his death, burial, and resurrection. In fact, it was not until more than a year into Christ's earthly ministry one that he first testified concerning the cross. The Bible repeatedly emphasizes and pinpoints the beginning of this message. Matthew 16, 21 From that time forth began Jesus to shew unto his disciples, how that he must go unto Jerusalem, and suffer many things of the elders and chief priests and scribes, and be killed, and be raised again the third day. Mark 8, 31 And he began to teach them, that the Son of Man must suffer many things, and be rejected of the elders, and of the chief priests and scribes, and be killed, and after three days rise again. One would think the disciples would have responded favorably to Christ's newly revealed message, but such was not to be the case. In fact, upon hearing from Christ concerning his death, Peter took him Christ, and began to rebuke him, saying, Be it far from thee, Lord, this shall not be unto thee, Matthew 16, 22. The Savior responded by rebuking Peter by saying, Get thee behind me, Satan. For thou savorest not the things that be of God, but the things that be of men. Mark 8, 33. Peter's response certainly did not indicate a man who believed and rejoiced in the news of the death, burial, and resurrection. Yet, Peter was not the only disciple to struggle with the message of the cross. In fact, none of the disciples understood the cross and were afraid to ask him what he meant. Mark 9, 31 For he taught his disciples, and said unto them, The Son of Man is delivered into the hands of men, and they shall kill him, and after that he is killed, he shall rise the third day. 32 But they understood not that saying, and were afraid to ask him. Following the crucifixion and resurrection, the disciples continued to struggle to comprehend and believe the gospel we believe. After Mary Magdalene witnessed the resurrection, 
she attempted to share this glorious news of Christ's resurrection to the disciples and when they had heard that he Christ was alive, and had been seen of her, they believed not, Mark 16, 11. Anyone teaching that the disciples were looking forward to the cross for salvation must figure out how to make sense of their reaction in unbelief. In fact, the disciples likened the news of a resurrected Christ to idle tales, Luke 24, 11. Surely, this is not the reaction of someone supposedly trusting in our gospel message to save them from hell, yet the Bible is clear. John the disciple whom Jesus loved was no exception. He did not believe until he came, to the sepulcher, and he saw, and believed, John 20, 8. Simply put, one cannot assume every time the word gospel shows up in scripture that it refers to the gospel we believe and preach. The word gospel means good tidings, compare Isaiah 61, 1 with Luke 4, 18. The disciples had heard and participated in plenty of preaching concerning a gospel, but it did not point to the death, burial, and resurrection. In fact, it was appropriately called the gospel of the kingdom. They Gospel of the Kingdom promised the establishment of God's future millennial kingdom upon this earth. It not only spoke of God's role in that kingdom, but also man's responsibilities. One of John's primary purposes was to prepare the way of the Lord, Matthew 3, 3, or to make ready a people prepared for the Lord, Luke 1, 17. As such, John exhorted men to be ready, saying, Repent yet for the kingdom of heaven is at hand, Matthew 3, 2. After Jesus' baptism, Christ too began to preach, Repent, for the kingdom of heaven is at hand, Matthew 4, 17. Both John and the Lord preached the kingdom as being at hand or within reach. Obviously, the desire was to prepare the people for the kingdom and the message preached was to be received by faith, Mark 1, 15. This gospel message of the kingdom provides its own unique elements. Looking ahead, the Lord promised that this gospel will be preached again during Daniel's 70th week. During that time, it will be preached throughout the entire world prior to the end of the world, Matthew 24, 14. Furthermore, Furthermore, it was intriguing because, unlike other gospels, it emphasized supernatural healing. Luke 9 one then he called his twelve disciples together, and gave them power and authority over all devils, and to cure diseases. Two and he sent them to preach the kingdom of God, and to heal the sick. Luke 9, 6 And they departed, and went through the towns, preaching the gospel, and healing everywhere. It is additionally important to understand the purpose of the gospel during this period the earthly ministry of the Lord. It involved seeking the kingdom rather than living in the kingdom. Matthew 6, 33 But seek ye first the kingdom of God, and his righteousness, and all these things shall be added unto you. Luke 12, 31 But rather seek ye the kingdom of God, and all these things shall be added unto you. If the purpose had merely involved establishing the kingdom, the Lord had ample opportunity when the people sought to make him king. John 6, 15 When Jesus therefore perceived that they would come and take him by force, to make him a king, he departed again into a mountain himself alone. Although the Lord Jesus Christ avoided the people's attempts to make him a king, the kingdom was indeed at hand. Therefore, the main emphasis of this age was getting ready for the kingdom yet to come. Matthew 24, 44 Therefore be ye also ready, for in such an hour as ye think not the Son of Man cometh. Matthew 25, 10 And while they went to buy, the bridegroom came, and they that were ready went in with him to the marriage, and the door was shut. With this in mind, the question remains what was the object of faith during the Lord's earthly ministry? Certainly, it must have been connected to the preaching of the kingdom that the gospel accounts emphasized. More specifically, it seems to have been the belief or acceptance of Jesus as the one who reigns over that kingdom. In regard to this reign, the Bible signifies the Lord's authority in the kingdom using three titles, 1, Anointed, Psalm 2, 2, 2, Christ, Acts 4, 26, and 3, Messiah or Meshes, 
John 1, 41, John 4, 25. One must understand the Savior's role as the Christ during his earthly ministry to comprehend God's desired confession. Fortunately, Simon Peter's confession offers the necessary enlightenment. Jesus asked the disciples who they thought him to be. Simon Peter issued forth the right answer Thou art the Christ, the Son of the living God, Matthew 16, 16. This precise confession obviously stirred the Savior's heart as he responded, Blessed art thou, Simon Bar, Jonah, for flesh and blood hath not revealed it unto thee, but my Father which is in heaven, Matthew 16, 17. Additionally, the woman at the well was truly transformed as she came to understand and identify Jesus as the Christ. Her words held great significance as he led her along to this statement, I know that Meshes cometh, which is called Christ, when he is come, he will tell us all things, John 4, 25. Once she stated this, the Lord plainly identified himself as the Messiah saying, I that speak unto thee am he, John 4, 26. Christ's confession to the woman so moved her that she left her water pot, John 4, 28, and went to the men of the city saying to the men, Come, See a man, which told me all things that ever I did, is not this the Christ? John 4, 29 Faith in Jesus as the Messiah is the foundational aspect of the earthly ministry of Christ. Even as early as the announcement of his birth, the emphasis was upon Christ the Lord, Luke 2, 11. Eight days after the Savior was born, he was taken to the temple where Simeon served. The Bible said of Simeon, it had been revealed unto him by the Holy Ghost. That he should not see death, before he had seen the Lord's Christ, Luke 2, 25-26. Thirty years later, when the Lord's ministry began, one of the disciples named Andrew went to his brother Simon and said, We have found the Meshes, which is, being interpreted, the Christ, John 1, 41. A survey of John chapter 7 reveals that this was a point of conversation among the masses during Christ's ministry, John 7, 26, 27, 31, 41, 42. In fact, John's gospel seems to summarize what he wrote and why he wrote his gospel, that ye might believe that Jesus is the Christ, the Son of God, and that believing ye might have life through his name, John 20, 31. 1. We know the timing based on tracing the annual Passover feasts. 4. The absence of faith in the very presence of God incarnate, the nation of Israel sadly manifested their utter faithlessness. In fact, the religious leaders demonstrated their sheer hypocrisy, Matthew 15, 1, by drawing near Christ with their mouths and honoring him with their lips when their hearts remained far from him, Matthew 15, 8. Unfortunately, the Lord's disciples did not display a much better testimony. The Gospel accounts reveal that Christ constantly rebuked their lack of faith, Matthew 8, 26. Yet, while expressing his frustration with the faithlessness of the Jews, he praised the faith of those among the Gentiles, Luke 7, 9. The Jews' faithless behavior was best demonstrated as many of Christ's disciples chose no longer to walk with him, John 6. 64 to 66. Christ drew massive crowds, yet their motives were commonly selfish and faithless. For instance, the scripture testified that a great multitude followed him, because they saw his miracles which he did on them that were diseased. Diseased, John 6, 2. Later, Jesus expressed his frustration concerning his faithless followers, Ye seek me, not because ye saw the miracles, but because ye did eat of the loaves, and were filled, John 6, 26. Within this context, the Bible says that Jesus perceived that they would come and take him by force, to make him a king, John 6, 15. Although John the Baptist, Jesus Christ, and the apostles preached the kingdom gospel, there was to be no physical kingdom available until after Christ died for the sins of the world. Even then, Christ was not interested in establishing a kingdom with those who exhibited the impure motives of unbelief. Therefore, 
Christ inquired what he would find at his second coming, nevertheless when the Son of Man cometh, shall he find faith on the earth? Luke 18, 8 The ultimate act of faithlessness involved the murder of the Christ who came to offer man life. From man's perspective, this heinous act was contrived by a backroom deal between Judas, the betrayer, John 13, 11, 21, John 18, 1 to 3, and the chief priests and Pharisees, Matthew 27, 1. It was encouraged by the common Jews, Mark 15, 11 to 13, Acts 7, 52, and carried out by the Romans, John 18, 31. Yet, from God's perspective, the crucifixion of Christ could be likened to the selling of Joseph. The Jews meant it for evil, but God meant it unto good, to bring to pass, as it is this day, to save much people alive, Genesis 50, 20. After all, Christ was delivered by the determinate counsel and foreknowledge of God, Acts 2, 23. 5. Salvation Those who teach that salvation was somehow earned by those who obediently kept the law contradict the words of the Savior. After all, during his earthly ministry, Christ looked at his audience and plainly declared, None of you keepeth the law, John 7, 19. In fact, if men could attain salvation apart from God, the incarnation, crucifixion, and resurrection proved to be in vain. Christ came to do what man could not to seek and to save that which was lost, Luke 19, 10. While this certainly encompassed more than merely the souls of men, no doubt it includes such salvation. Those who believed on the Savior as the Christ or the Messiah received him and were given power to become the sons of God, John 1, 12. They were born, not of blood, nor of the will of the flesh, nor of the will of man, but of God. John 1, 13. This was the new birth about which Jesus questioned Nicodemus, John 3, 3 8. Those who believed on the Lord were given to the Savior by the Father, John 6, 37, and became known as belonging to the Son and to the Father, John 17, 6 10. In other words, they were his sheep who had eternal life and would never perish, nor could any man pluck them out of my Christ's hand. John 10, 28, or out of my Father's hand, John 10, 29. Furthermore, they were guaranteed to be raised up at the last day, John 6, 39-40, 40, 44. There is no reasonable explanation that anyone would ignore these passages and attempt to give man credit for his salvation. 6. The closing event the death, burial, and resurrection of Christ no one should have been surprised by the suffering and cruel mocking that Christ had to endure. After all, the Old Testament scriptures clearly indicated that Christ would suffer, Psalm 22, 1-21, Isaiah 53, 1-12. These truths were confirmed by Christ when he rebuked the two disciples on the way to Emmaus saying, O fools, and slow of heart to believe all that the prophets have spoken, Ought not Christ to have suffered these things, and to enter into his glory? Luke 24, 25-26 Furthermore, when the Savior was eight days old, he was brought to the temple for his circumcision. Simeon saw Christ and alluded to his sufferings when talking to Mary, Yet, a sword shall pierce through thy own soul also, that the thoughts of many hearts may be revealed. Luke 2, 35 Additionally, the Savior pointed frequently to his sufferings while upon the earth, John 2, 19. Ultimately, everybody but the Godhead was surprised by the crucifixion. Paul testified, We speak the wisdom of God in a mystery, even the hidden wisdom, which God ordained before the world unto our glory, which none of the princes of this world knew, for had they known it, they would not have crucified the Lord of glory, 1 Corinthians 2, 7-8. Yet it seems odd that those who called for Christ to be put to death, Mark 15, 13-14, suddenly changed their tune and began tempting Christ to come down from the cross, Mark 15, 29-32. Perhaps this is when the devil realized that Christ was blotting out the handwriting of ordinances that was against us, which was contrary to us, and took it out of the way, 
nailing it to his cross, Colossians 2, 14. After all, it was at that time that Christ spoiled principalities and powers making a shoe of them openly, triumphing over them in it, Colossians 2, 15. The crucifixion of Christ put on full display the Jews' ultimate rejection of God. It showed their unbelief concerning the law, the prophets, the Psalms, and now Christ himself. Israel's unbelief moved God to jealousy. They provoked him to anger with their vanities. Therefore, God would choose to move the Jews to jealousy through those who are not a people and provoke them to anger with a foolish nation, Deuteronomy 32, 21, Romans 10, 19, Romans 11, 11. The Gentiles' door of opportunity had already been cracked open, but now it would swing wide open. The cross made all the difference. 7. The Age of the Church, Acts Revelation 4 from man's perspective, the church was parenthetically placed inside of the age of readiness. From God's perspective, the church was plan A from the very beginning. 1. The opening event the death, burial, and resurrection of Christ since the age of the church is ongoing with an unspecified duration of time, it is the only age where we cannot yet ascertain its length in years. The question as to when the New Testament Church was founded has been debated for nearly as long as its existence. This debate takes upon itself even greater significance when considering the audience of the Gospels. If the New Testament Church merely continues the Old Testament Church, Acts 7, 38, then the rules of the Old Testament, along with those directions found within the Gospels, equally and completely apply to the New Testament Church today. However, the New Testament Church is not simply a continuation of any Old Testament group but a distinct entity in and of itself. This confusion concerning application explains why some groups have chosen to follow practices matching the Old Testament priesthood including the propagation of the unscriptural and unsavory marriage between church and state. Furthermore, Bible Believing Christianity resoundingly rejects the doctrinal position that the New Testament Church's origin was prior to Christ's sacrificial death on the cross. The Church was certainly in view or in the mind of God before the cross, but it is wrong to claim that it could have been in existence prior to that time. Too granted, many of the truths taught by Christ universally transcend time and dispensations, but the prophecies specifically aimed at Israel cannot and should not be usurped by the Church even by those with the best of intentions. Replacement theology teaches just the opposite stating that the church usurps Israel's promises and blessings. Many Christians propose that the New Testament church began during the earthly ministry of Christ. After all, the principle of the church was established, Matthew 16, 18, Matthew 18, 20, Jesus Christ could have served as its head, Matthew 23, 8, and pastor, John 10, 11, 14, the group had rules for discipline, Matthew 18, 15 to 17, and practiced baptism, Matthew 28, 16 to 20, and the Lord's Supper, Matthew 26, 26 to 29. Those who subscribe to this doctrinal position tend to believe that the teachings presented in the Gospels are almost without exception directly applicable to the New Testament Church. During Christ's earthly ministry, he spoke of the church's protection and the failure of the gates of hell to prevail both of which he spoke of using the future tense. For example, Christ promised, I will build future my church, Matthew 16, 18. The Lord's allusion to building something yet unconstructed most definitely provides the context as to the church's origin being yet future. In the Old Testament, Christ was prophesied as a stone refused by the builders the nation of Israel. 3. These Old Testament references show that the rock was manifest to Israel in the context of the Davidic kingdom with veiled prophetic references to Daniel's 70th week, Daniel 2, 34-35. These references most assuredly point forward to the rejected stone and are fulfilled in the New Testament. They are directly associated to Christ's rejection and crucifixion, Mark 12. 10. Luke 20, 17 to 18, Acts 4, 11. The rejected Christ became the precious cornerstone, the head of the corner.
Matthew 21, 42 Jesus saith unto them, Did ye never read in the scriptures, the stone which the builders rejected, the same is become the head of the corner, this is the Lord's doing, and it is marvelous in our eyes? Paul later declared Christ as the foundation, 1 Corinthians 3, 11, and chief cornerstone of the one body consisting of Jews and Gentiles, Ephesians 2, 20. These truths all point to Christ's crucifixion as the time of initial construction a crucifixion announced in the context of the initial proclamation of the church, Matthew 16, 21-23. Concerning the church and its construction, Christ simply prophesied of events that were yet future not something presently being fulfilled. In the same context after Christ's crucifixion, the Lord identified the church as my church a purchase certainly not consummated prior to his crucifixion. In fact, the first reference, reference to the church of God, a phrase denoting possession or ownership of the church, suggests that the church became his church through a blood purchase that he made upon the cross of Calvary. Acts 20, 28 Take heed therefore unto yourselves, and to all the flock, over the which the Holy Ghost hath made you overseers, to feed the church of God, which he hath purchased with his own blood. The concept of this blood purchase matches other New Testament teachings like that found in Ephesians and Colossians. The believer's redemption or purchase resulted from the blood shed upon Calvary it was through his blood. Ephesians 1 7 In whom we have redemption through his blood, the forgiveness of sins, according to the riches of his grace, Colossians 1, 14 In whom we have redemption through his blood, even the forgiveness of sins. The purchase was made through the shedding of blood, but the transaction was only completed once Christ, the great high priest, placed his blood upon the mercy seat in heaven, Hebrews 9, 12-14. Furthermore, the Bible identifies the Holy Ghost, given to believers, as the earnest, a sum given denoting a promise of future completed payment, of this purchase, Ephesians 1, 14. This payment in earnest involved an acquisition that will be finalized when the bodies of the saved are fully redeemed, Romans 8, 23. In support of these truths, God's word emphasizes that the New Testament was not in effect until after the death of the testator. Jesus Christ. After the death of the testator, the testament was in force with the New Testament as its instrument. Hebrews 9, 16 For where a testament is, there must also of necessity be the death of the testator. 17 For a testament is of force after men are dead, otherwise it is of no strength at all while the testator liveth. Most of those who have recognized the combination of all these elements believe that the New Testament church was at least birthed from the womb on the day of Pentecost but not before. After all, it is at this point that the Bible says that the Lord added to the church, such as should be saved, Acts 2, 47. However, this truth alone does not account for all the necessary pieces of the puzzle. Perhaps the most accurate, safe, and scriptural teaching proclaims that there was also a church, called, Out Assembly, present during the earthly ministry of Christ. The following two passages seem to indicate this truth. Matthew 18, 17 And if he shall neglect to hear them, tell it unto the church, but if he neglect to hear the church, let him be unto thee as an heathen man and a publican. Hebrews 2, 12 saying, I will declare thy name unto my brethren, in the midst of the church will I sing praise unto thee. Most assuredly, there was a called, out assembly, a church, present when Jesus walked the earth and before that time. For however, it is important to note that the church to which Jesus referred could not be the New Testament church as the New Testament was not in effect until the death of Christ upon the cross the death of the testator of the New Testament. 5. The church could not be rightfully called my church by Christ until purchased with his blood, Acts 20, 28, at Calvary. Obviously, until Christ hung and died upon the cross, this blood was not yet shed. However, the completion of the transaction did not take place until Christ sprinkled his blood upon the mercy seat in heaven. That sprinkling took place between the events recorded in the next two passages, the two ascensions. Before first ascension, John 20, 17 Jesus saith unto her, 
touch me not, for I am not yet ascended to my father, but go to my brethren, and say unto them, I ascend unto my father, and your father, and to my God, and your God. Christ's statement in John clearly shows that he had not yet initially ascended to the Father. Yet, the latter narrative recorded in Matthew chapter 28 below shows that by this time, he had both ascended to the Father and returned to earth again. This truth is reflected in the fact that he could now be touched. After first ascension but before final ascension, Matthew 28, 9 And as they went to tell his disciples, behold, Jesus met them, saying, all hail. And they came and held him by the feet, and worshipped him. These combined truths reveal some things that we know for sure, the New Testament church did not begin before Christ placed his blood upon the mercy seat in heaven. However, it must have begun by the day of Pentecost recorded in Acts chapter 2 because something cannot be added to that which had not yet commenced. The Bible says that the Lord added to the church, Acts 2, 47, so it certainly had to be in existence, even if at that time it only consisted of a Jewish membership, Romans 11, 17, Ephesians 3, 6. Thus, these truths would narrow the beginning of the New Testament church to some time between the events of John 20, 17 and Acts 2, 47. It is inconceivable that any Christian could underestimate the significance of Christ's death, burial, and resurrection since they are the most pivotal events in all human history. Yet, the disciples themselves were not completely aware of the ramifications resulting from the resurrection until some time after Christ's resurrection. Additionally, the Bible points out that Christ's first appearance to the disciples took place upon the same day as the resurrection by twice stating it in the same verse then the same day at evening being the first day of the week. John 20, 19 There are no vain words in the Bible and this double witness is not recorded by accident. What happened during this meeting is likely the pivotal event concerning the church. Upon the first day of the week, Jesus came and breathed upon the disciples and they received the Holy Ghost. All the necessary elements for a New Testament church were now in place, 1. Jesus died on the cross, 2. Jesus journeyed to the mercy seat in heaven and placed his blood upon it, and, three, now he breathed upon his disciples for them to receive the Holy Ghost. John 20, 22 And when he had said this, he breathed on them, and saith unto them, Receive ye the Holy Ghost, too in fact, it is important to note that the New Testament does not become a force until after the death of the testator, Jesus Christ. Read Hebrews 9 16 to 17 for an understanding concerning the New Testament and the necessity for Christ to die before the New Testament is in force. 3 Psalm 118, 22 The stone which the builders refused is become the headstone of the corner. Isaiah 8, 14 And he shall be for a sanctuary, but for a stone of stumbling and for a rock of offense to both the houses of Israel, for a gin and for a snare to the inhabitants of Jerusalem. Isaiah 28 16 Therefore thus saith the Lord God, Behold, I lay in Zion for a foundation a stone, a tried stone, a precious corner stone, a sure foundation, he that believeth shall not make haste. For the book of Acts references the church in the wilderness, Acts 7, 38. It is important to note that church can simply refer to a called, out assembly or a congregation. Comparing scripture with scripture offers the following, Hebrew 2, 12 Church quotes Psalm 22, 22 which used congregation. 5 The sequence of events and their proximity in scripture sometimes offers some of the greatest insights into some of the most important truths. Mark chapter 15 tells us that Christ gave up the ghost, signifying that he died, in verse 37. The next verse continues the account by stating that the temple veil was rent in two from the top to the bottom. This severing of the temple veil opened the way into the most holy place and allowed all to see that God's glory was no longer there but had departed. Mark 15, 37 And Jesus cried with a loud voice, and gave up the ghost. 38 And the veil of the temple was rent in twain from the top to the bottom. 2. Dispensational continuity While God's dealings with man change from age to age, God never changes. 
Therefore, there exists continuity between ages that would not exist if over time God's character evolved. Many of the things declared by God to be wrong in the past continue to be wrong in the church age, but the way they are to be corrected often changes. This is certainly not an exhaustive study covering the dispensational continuity, but God continues to employ the use of the conscience and the law in this present age. The conscience remains a tool used by God to deal with man concerning the truth. Sadly, that conscience can be ineffective when weakened. 1 Corinthians 8, 12, defiled. 1 Corinthians 8, 7, or seared. 1 Timothy 4, 2. Contrary to many Bible teachers, the law also maintains certain roles in the church age. In part, this involves its application to the proper audience and according to sound doctrine, as Paul said, we know that the law is good, if a man use it lawfully, knowing this, the law is not made for a righteous man, but for the lawless and disobedient, and if there be any other thing that is contrary to sound doctrine, according to the glorious gospel of the blessed God, which was committed to my trust, 1 Timothy 1, 8-11. 3. The necessity of faith as in previous ages, men, women, boys, and girls must believe the revealed word of God to have fellowship with God. Distinct from previous ages, that revealed word of God today requires that men place their faith in the finished work of Christ on the cross. Paul plainly spelled out this gospel message as the death, burial, and resurrection of Christ. 1 Corinthians 15, 1 Moreover, brethren, I declare unto you the gospel which I preached unto you, which also ye have received, and wherein ye stand, too by which also ye are saved, if ye keep in memory what I preached unto you, unless ye have believed in vain. 3 For I delivered unto you first of all that which I also received, how that Christ died for our sins according to the scriptures, for and that he was buried and that he rose again the third day according to the scriptures. The message of the death, burial, and resurrection was preached by men in the church age as early as the day of Pentecost. On that day, Peter reminded the Jews that Jesus, being delivered by the determinate counsel and foreknowledge of God, yet the Jews have taken, and by wicked hands have crucified and slain, whom God hath raised up, having loosed the pains of death, because it was not possible that he should be holden of it. Acts 2, 23-24 A little later in the same sermon, Peter reminded the Jews of the words of David concerning the resurrection of Christ, that his soul was not left in hell, neither his flesh did see corruption and that it was this Jesus that God raised up, whereof we all are witnesses, Acts 2, 31-32. If that were not sufficient, Peter stated emphatically, Let all the house of Israel know assuredly, that God hath made that same Jesus, whom ye have crucified, both Lord and Christ, Acts 2, 36. Upon hearing, the Jews were pricked in their heart, Acts 2, 37, and they that gladly received his word were baptized, Acts 2, 41. 6. Again, in the next chapter of Acts, Peter preached the death, burial, and resurrection of Christ. When the healing of the lame man garnered an audience, Peter said, Ye men of Israel, the God of Abraham, hath glorified his son Jesus, whom ye delivered up, and denied him in the presence of Pilate, when he was determined to let him go. But ye denied the Holy One and the just, and killed the Prince of Life, whom God hath raised from the dead, whereof we are witnesses. Acts 3, 12 to 15. Before concluding, Peter declared, Unto you first God, having raised up his son Jesus, sent him to bless you, in turning away every one of you from his iniquities, Acts 3, 26. In fact, it was this preaching of the resurrection that angered the religious leaders that they taught the people, and preached through Jesus the resurrection from the dead, Acts 4, 2, howbeit many of them which heard the word believed, Acts 4, 4. The next day, the Jewish religious leaders gathered and set the apostles in their midst to question them regarding the healing of the lame man. Unsurprisingly, Peter again used this opportunity to preach the death, burial, and resurrection of Christ. In response to the rulers' questions, Peter said, B. It known unto you all, 
and to all the people of Israel, that by the name of Jesus Christ of Nazareth, whom ye crucified, whom God raised from the dead. Acts 4, 10 He followed by saying, Neither is there salvation in any other, for there is none other name under heaven given among men, whereby we must be saved. Acts 4, 12 those who would discount Peter's message as coming from ignorance of the truth need to re-examine their spiritual infidelity. The apostles were imprisoned for their preaching, but as soon as they were freed, they again began preaching the gospel message. When the rulers found them and questioned why they continued to preach Christ, the apostles answered that they ought to obey God rather than men. Acts 5, 29 Peter again recognized an open door to preach the gospel and said, the God of our fathers raised up Jesus, whom ye slew and hanged on a tree, Acts 5, 30. Despite the threats hounding the apostles, the Bible says, daily in the temple, and in every house, they ceased not to teach and preach Jesus Christ, Acts 5, 42. This gospel message of the death, burial, and resurrection is the theme of the New Testament church. Sometimes their message was shortened, only mentioning the resurrection, but the resurrection assuredly demanded the death and the burial of the resurrected Savior. Men who refused, or now refuse, to repent toward God and exercise faith in the Lord Jesus Christ were, and are, lost and without hope. Paul preached as much. Acts 20, 21 Paul testifying both to the Jews, and also to the Greeks, repentance toward God, and faith toward our Lord Jesus Christ. The solution for the soul is simple during this age, believe on the Lord Jesus Christ, and thou shalt be saved, Acts 16, 31. 7 This faith in the gospel of Christ involves two aspects, 1, belief in one's heart and, 2, confession from one's mouth. Romans 10, 10 For with the heart man believeth unto righteousness, and with the mouth confession is made unto salvation. 13 For whosoever shall call upon the name of the Lord shall be saved. 6 Unfortunately, there are those who recognize the gospel being preached but teach that those espousing such truths remained ignorant of the significance of Christ's death, burial, and crucifixion. Yet, the Bible says that it was Jesus who opened their understanding after his resurrection. Luke 24, 45 Then opened he their understanding, that they might understand the scriptures. 46 And said unto them, Thus it is written, and thus it behoved Christ to suffer, and to rise from the dead the third day. 7 There are those who struggle with repentance since salvific passages like Acts 16, 31 only mention believe on the Lord Jesus Christ. The answer to this conundrum is quite simple. The jailer exhibited repentance when one considers how he reacted before and after hearing Paul and Silas sing and testify of the Lord. The jailer before the preaching, who, having received received such a charge, thrust them into the inner prison, and made their feet fast in the stocks, Acts 16, 24, and after it with the humble question, Sirs, what must I do to be saved? Acts 16, 30. 4. The absence of faith in the accounts of the early church in the book of Acts, we read about the multitudes getting saved. Yet, it must be understood that the majority rejected the gospel. Unbelievers struggled to forsake their idols and idolatrous culture to believe and trust in the Lord Jesus Christ. The spread of the gospel caused financial, cultural, and religious problems for a Christ, forsaking world. They tried to solve the problem by putting to death those who preached, believed, and taught the gospel of Christ. Saul, whose name was changed to Paul severely persecuted the church until he met the Savior. The call of the Apostle Paul meant the further spread of the gospel, but he too was met with rejection. His ministry commenced as a ministry tailored toward the Jews, but the Jews generally rejected the Apostle's message, and, in each instance, Paul turned to the Gentiles. Even among the Gentiles, the preaching of the Apostle Paul was rebuffed. While some believed, and still believe today, the gospel message puts man at a crossroads. He must forsake trusting in anything else for eternal life and solely trust in Jesus Christ and Him alone.
The Bible prophesies that man's spirituality will continually decline in this age. After all, the Apostle Paul declared that evil men and seducers shall wax worse and worse, deceiving, and being deceived, 2 Timothy 3, 13. For men shall be lovers of their own selves, covetous, boasters, proud, blasphemers, disobedient to parents, unthankful, unholy, without natural affection, truce breakers, false accusers, incontinent, fierce, despisers of those that are good, traitors, heady, high-minded, lovers of pleasures more than lovers of God, having a form of godliness, but denying the power thereof, from such turn away, 2 Timothy 3, 2-5. Unfortunately, the church continues to conform to the world and the world applauds the efforts of Christianity to conform to the world's dictates. Yet, those in the church are deceived by this decline in spirituality as it is portrayed as a form of godliness, 2 Timothy 3, 5. Increasingly, men will not endure sound doctrine but turn to fables, 2 Timothy 4, 3-4. These fables cause men to see themselves as just and righteous. The true and living God and his precious word have been replaced and men will seek to spoil others through philosophy and vain deceit, after the tradition of men, after the rudiments of the world, and not after Christ, Colossians 2, 8. The Apostle Paul described man's decline in Romans chapter 1. God made himself known to man, Romans 1, 19, but man chose not to glorify God or be thankful unto him, Romans 1, 21. As a result, man became vain in his imaginations and his foolish heart was darkened, Romans 1, 21. Soon thereafter, man changed the glory of God into images, Romans 1, 23, and the truth of God into a lie and worshipped and served the creature, Romans 1, 25. Things continue to spiral out of control as man becomes more oblivious to the truth. God then gives man up to uncleanness. Romans 1, 24, vile affections, Romans 1, 26 to 27, and a reprobate mind, Romans 1, 28. All this has taken place because man did not like to retain God in his knowledge, Romans 1, 28. 5. Salvation When a man trusts in Christ's death, burial, and resurrection, he receives a myriad of benefits. Among these is the acceptance of Christ's propitiation on his behalf. 1 John 2, 1 My little children, these things write I unto you, that ye sin not. And if any man sin, we have an advocate with the Father, Jesus Christ the righteous, too and he is the propitiation for our sins, and not for ours only, but also for the sins of the whole world. The word propitiation simply means to satisfy the demands for justice. Man is a sinner and the righteous God hates sin. Therefore, sin must be judged and all those who do not know Jesus Christ as their Savior are under the condemnation of God's wrath. However, when a man trusts in Jesus Christ as Savior, Christ stands between that individual and the wrath of God. As a result, Christ took the Father's wrath upon himself. Himself, paid the price of that man's judgment, and gives the believing sinner eternal life. Romans 3, 25 Whom God hath set forth to be a propitiation through faith in his blood, to declare his righteousness for the remission of sins that are past, through the forbearance of God, 1 John 4, 10 Herein is love, not that we loved God, but that he loved us, and sent his Son to be the propitiation for our sins. Because of Christ's propitiation, we also receive the glorious benefits of justification along with imputed righteousness. Christ took our sin upon himself and bore the penalty for that sin. Correspondingly, Christ imputes to us his righteousness declaring the believer just in the presence of God the Father. 2 Corinthians 5, 21 For he God the Father hath made him God the Son to be sin for us, who God the Son knew no sin, that we might be made the righteousness of God in him God the Son. Romans 4, 17, As it is written, I have made thee a father of many nations, before him whom he believed, even God, who quick kenneth the dead, and calleth those things which be not as though they were. 
18 who against hope believed in hope, that he might become the father of many nations, according to that which was spoken, so shall thy seed be. 19 And being not weak in faith, he considered not his own body now dead, when he was about an hundred years old, neither yet the deadness of Sarah's womb, 20 He staggered not at the promise of God through unbelief, but was strong in faith, giving glory to God, 21 And being fully persuaded that, what he had promised, he was able also to perform. 22 And therefore it was imputed to him for righteousness. 23 Now it was not written for his sake alone, that it was imputed to him, 24 But for us also, to whom it shall be imputed, if we believe on him that raised up Jesus our Lord from the dead, 25 Who was delivered for our offenses, and was raised again for our justification. Acts 13, 39 And by him all that believe are justified from all things, from which ye could not be justified by the law of Moses. Because of that wonderful justification, we, who were once God's enemies, Romans 5, 10, now enjoy peace with God. Romans 5, 1 Therefore being justified by faith, we have peace with God through our Lord Jesus Christ, this peace comes when we get saved because God himself, through the person of his Spirit, takes up permanent residence within us. 1 Corinthians 3, 16 Know ye not that ye are the temple of God? and that the Spirit of God dwelleth in you? Romans 8, 11 But if the Spirit of him that raised up Jesus from the dead dwell in you, he that raised up Christ from the dead shall also quicken your mortal bodies by his Spirit that dwelleth in you. The Spirit serves as the earnest of our inheritance and seals us until the day of redemption. 2 Corinthians 1, 21 Now he which establisheth us with you in Christ, and hath anointed us, is God. 22 Who hath also sealed us, and given the earnest of the Spirit in our hearts. Ephesians 1, 13 In whom ye also trusted, after that ye heard the word of truth, the gospel of your salvation, in whom also after that ye believed, ye were sealed with that Holy Spirit of promise. Ephesians 4, 30 And grieve not the Holy Spirit of God, whereby ye are sealed unto the day of redemption. Because of this wonderful salvation, all our sins are forgiven, even those yet in the future. Colossians 2, 13 And you, being dead in your sins and the uncircumcision of your flesh, hath he quickened together with him, having forgiven you all trespasses, Titus 2, 13 Looking for that blessed hope, and the glorious appearing of the great God and our Saviour Jesus Christ, 14 Who gave himself for us, that he might redeem us from all iniquity, and purify unto himself a peculiar people, zealous of good works. To summarize, believers in the age of the church are saved through repentance and belief in the gospel of the death, burial, and resurrection of Christ. This allows each believer to enjoy Christ's propitiation, imputed righteousness, and his justification. Additionally, the believer is at peace with God, has the indwelling spirit, and is forgiven of all sins. 6. The closing event the blessed hope or rapture of the church every age prior to the church age ended with a great failure on the part of man requiring God's intervention. Unfortunately, the age of the church is no exception. The age of innocence ended with the fall of man requiring God's intervention in clothing the first couple and removing them from the Garden of Eden. The age of conscience worsened to the point that God had to send a flood to start over with one man and his family. The age of government declined so much that men tried to build a tower to reach to heaven and make a name for themselves. God had to confound their language to scatter them. The age of patriarchs found the Israelites in slavery in Egypt and God had to send Moses to bring them out. The age of law found Israel in the midst of 400 years of silence that God broke with a voice in the wilderness John the Baptist. The age of readiness ended with multiple groups some of which were staunch enemies, joining forces to crucify God's Son, whom God raised again. The church's rapture should be viewed for what it is. It is not God's gift to the church because of their superior spirituality. In the last days, the church will lose its effectiveness as men become worse and worse, 2 Timothy 3, 13. Much like Israel of old, the church was placed here to be a light to a dark world. Again, like Israel, 
the church has drifted from God's word which made it distinguishable from the world. It has lost its ability to appeal to the world's conscience by pointing them to the gospel of Christ as the solution. Because of the church's worldliness, the believer's effectiveness has been negated. The world's population continues to expand with a disproportionate growth in the size of the church. With all our technological advancements and innovations to spread the gospel, there are millions of people who still have never even heard the gospel of the grace of God. Paul says he speaks this to our shame, 1 Corinthians 15, 34. As ambassadors for Christ, 2 Corinthians 5, 20, we are failing in God's command to present his interests unto the ends of the earth, Acts 13, 47. The remnant of believers continually shrinks in proportion to the vast population on the broad way that leadeth to destruction, Matthew 7, 13. Sometime in the future, known only to God, the age of the church will abruptly end with the rapture as described in 1 Thessalonians 4, 13-17. It seems as though God will at last tire of our feeble and weakened attempts to spread the gospel of God's grace and will literally yank us, the church, up out of the way. Christians, indwelt and sealed with God's Spirit, will leave this world and the age of readiness resumes. 7. The Age of the Readiness, Revelation 5-19 1. The opening event The Blessed Hope or Rapture of the Church The Rapture of all believers will likely not be the worldwide catastrophe pontificated by some of the brethren who have addicted themselves to sensationalistic teaching. Instead, the mass media and governments will likely spin the mass exodus of Christians into a believable tale of the world's deliverance from pesky believers. These types of explanations are aimed at easing fears so that a semblance of normalcy can be restored. Furthermore, it is important to note another false conception. The church's rapture is the event that turns God's attention back to the nation of Israel, but the covenant made with the Jews is a false covenant of peace with the Antichrist, the Prince, that sets in motion Daniel's 70th week. Daniel 9, 27 And he shall confirm the covenant with many for one week, and in the midst of the week he shall cause the sacrifice and the oblation to cease, and for the overspreading of abominations he shall make it desolate, even until the consummation, and that determined shall be poured upon the desolate. Before considering the opening events of Daniel's 70th week part 2 of the Age of Readiness one must understand God's purpose for the age. Irrefutably, the 70 weeks in Daniel chapter 9 apply directly and specifically to Israel. Gabriel identified the seven purposes of this age to God's target audience, 1, to finish the transgression, 2, to make an end of sins, 3, to make reconciliation for iniquity, 4 to bring in everlasting righteousness, 5, to seal up the vision, 6, to seal up the prophecy, and, 7, to anoint the most holy. Daniel 9, 24 70 weeks are determined upon thy Daniel's people the Jews and upon thy Daniel's holy city Jerusalem, to finish the transgression, and to make an end of sins, and to make reconciliation for iniquity, and to bring in everlasting righteousness, and to seal up the vision and prophecy and to anoint the Most Holy. With 60, 9 of the 70 weeks of years in the history books, the seven expressed purposes await their fulfillment during Daniel's 70th week. Unsurprisingly, prophecy students have focused much of their attention upon this prophetically unfulfilled age. The final week, the seven years yet future, begins with a prince, not the prince, confirming a false covenant with many promising seven years of religious liberty. Providentially, Daniel chapter 9 provides the key for Bible students to know for sure Daniel's 70th week remains entirely in the future. The false prince will confirm his covenant with Israel for seven years. Without the confirmation of the covenant, no part of Daniel's 70th week could have yet taken place. The first 60, 9 weeks ends without such a covenant, and God parenthetically inserted the church age prior to the inception of the 70th week. The Church Age has now encompassed approximately 2,000 years and closes with the Blessed Hope, or the Rapture of the Church. Although the Prince, Daniel 9, 26, confirms his covenant with Israel for a full seven years, 
in the midst of the week of years, the prince will reveal his true intentions. Daniel 9, 2 7 BAND In the midst of the week he shall cause the sacrifice and the ablation to cease, the Bible repeatedly refers to this pivotal event in Daniel 11, 31, Daniel 12, 11, Matthew 24, 15, and Mark 13, 14 as the abomination of desolation. We know it will take place in the midst of the week most likely at the midway point. This is the reason for so many designations addressing half of the week of years, 1260 days, time, times, and half a time, time equaling one year, and 40, two months. Everything during this age hinges upon this key event at the midpoint. Daniel's 70th week will reintroduce a daily Jewish sacrifice. In fact, the scripture pinpoints both the beginning and the interruption of these sacrifices. The easiest of these bookends to determine is the sacrifice's interruption. After all, the scripture plainly states that at the midpoint of the week, the prince will cause the sacrifice and the ablation to cease. Once we understand this, we can then pinpoint when the sacrifice begins by using another time element provided the 2300 days mentioned in Daniel chapter 8. Daniel 8, 14. For now, we must simply recognize, 1, that the covenant starts the clock for Daniel's 70th week, 2, followed by the building of the temple which could take approximately 7 months to complete, 3, the daily sacrifice ends with the abomination of desolation, and, 4, from that point forward the Gentiles will tread underfoot the holy city for 40, 2 months, 3 and 1 half years, Revelation 11, 2. The book of Daniel contains some other interesting numbers. These numbers must be charted for a fuller understanding of the scope of teaching. Once these issues are addressed, we will proceed to the opening days of Daniel's 70th week. The abomination of desolation, the hinge upon which Daniel's 70th week hangs, takes place at the midpoint sandwiched between two equal, three and one, half year periods or 1,260 days or 40, two months. The 1,290 days, Daniel chapter 12, however, introduces another number of days pointing to an additional 30 days beyond Daniel's 70th week. Daniel 12, 11 and from the time that the daily sacrifice shall be taken away, and the abomination that maketh desolate set up, there shall be 1,290 days. Why the additional 30 days beyond the end of the 1260 days? It is likely that the temple's desecration at the midpoint. Midpoint necessitates a cleansing. This cleansing takes place for 30 days following the end of the 70 weeks. The 1335 days, Daniel 12, 12 adds one more time frame the 1335 days. This time likely encompasses the judgment of the nations which follows Christ's second advent, Matthew 25, 31-46. Daniel 12, 12 Blessed is he that waiteth, and cometh to the thousand three hundred and five and thirty days. The two thousand three hundred days, the most commonly misunderstood and misapplied prophetic period is found in Daniel chapter 8 the two thousand three hundred days, Daniel 8, 13-14. Its resolution is the easiest because of two features mentioned. First, that Daniel's 70th week fully encapsulates the full 2300 day period. Secondly, that the period consists of three interrelated elements, one, the daily sacrifice from start to finish, two, the transgression of desolation, aka the abomination of desolation, at the midpoint, and, three, the Gentiles treading underfoot the sanctuary for 40, two months. The 2300 days begins at the commencement of the daily sacrifice during the prophetic 70th week. It does not end until the times of the Gentiles be fulfilled, Luke 21, 24, at the close of the second half, Revelation 11, 2. The question introducing this unique period clues the reader into the three elements combined to span the entire 2,300 days, from verses 13 and 14. Daniel 8, 1 3 A Then I heard one saint speaking, and another saint said unto that certain saint which spake, 
how long shall be the vision concerning the daily sacrifice, carefully read the question for exactly what it says without any preconceived notions. The first element of the vision concerns the length of the vision regarding the daily sacrifice which provides the starting point for the 2300 days. We must mathematically backtrack into the starting point. The scripture confirms that the daily sacrifice ceases in the midst of the week, Daniel 9, 27, by what the Bible refers to as the abomination of desolation. This 2300, day vision refers to this event as the transgression of desolation. Daniel 8, 1 3b, and the transgression of desolation, to give both the sanctuary and the host to be trodden underfoot. Because the vision of the 2300 days mentions the sanctuary being trodden underfoot, we know the precise end point of the vision from the facts provided in Revelation chapter 12. The next verse tells us how long, 1, the daily sacrifice, 2, the abomination of desolation, and, 3, the Gentiles treading upon the sanctuary lasts 2,300 days altogether followed by the sanctuary being cleansed after Daniel's 70th week ends. Daniel 8, 14 And he said unto me, Unto 2,300 days, then shall the sanctuary be cleansed. What does the 2,300 days, or 6 1 3, year period, encompass? The inquiry concerning how long reveals that it commences from the beginning of the daily sacrifice up through the transgression of desolation the midpoint of the seven years and through the forty, two months that the sanctuary and the host is to be trodden underfoot. Since the full seven, year period encompasses exactly 2,520 days, 1,260 plus 1,260, Subtracting the 2,300 days from the total period leaves 220 days remaining. This period of 7-1-3 months allows for the building of the temple along with the preparations necessary for the daily sacrifice to begin. This reveals that the 7-year covenant which follows the rapture of the church will begin with 220 days of preparation before the daily sacrifice can start. The daily sacrifice continues up until the midway point or the abomination of desolation, when the temple is desecrated. At that time, the man of sin sitteth in the temple of God, shewing himself that he is God, 2 Thessalonians 2, 4. Most likely, the man of sin will sacrifice something on the altar thus polluting the temple and the sanctuary, Daniel 11, 31. It is important to note that at the halfway point of the week of years, Satan is cast out of heaven. This must be the halfway points because the Bible says that he persecutes the woman, Israel, for time, times, and half a time, Revelation 12, 13-14, Daniel 12, 7, or three and one half years. Daniel's 70th week commences when the prince confirms a false covenant for seven years. Approximately 220 days later, the daily sacrifices begin which last about 1,040 days until the sanctuary's desecration at the midpoint of Daniel's 70th week. Satan causes this abomination after he is cast down from heaven to earth where he persecutes Israel for three and one half years. At this same point, the Gentiles begin to tread the sanctuary underfoot and do so for 40, two months. When Jesus returns, he deals with the devil, cleanses the temple, judges the nations, and establishes his kingdom. These last few events take place toward the very end of the 70th week and during the 70, five days following. 2. Dispensational continuity overall, very little continuity exists between the church age and the concluding portion of the age of readiness. However, the age understandably has much in common with the time of Christ's earthly ministry. Some things the age will have in common with the church age involve the implementation of the conscience of man as one of the tools God uses to deal with man concerning the truth. Additionally, it is hard to imagine that any God, ordained preaching post, Calvary would exclude the message of the death, burial, and resurrection. As to the similarities that the age will possess with the previous age known as the age of readiness, there will be a return to the preaching of the gospel of the kingdom that was preached during the Lord's earthly ministry. 3. The Necessity of Faith Matthew 24, 
14 And this gospel of the kingdom shall be preached in all the world for a witness unto all nations, and then shall the end come. This verse foretells the preaching of the gospel of the kingdom that will be reinstituted during Daniel's 70th week. Understanding a little grammar helps understand the message. The word gospel is modified by the prepositional phrase of the kingdom. The purpose of a prepositional phrase is to offer clarity concerning other words found within a sentence. In the case of Matthew 24, 14, the prepositional phrase of the kingdom offers clarity to the identity of which gospel. The prepositional phrase is made up of three component parts, of, preposition, they, modifier, kingdom, noun. In other words, the gospel to which the passage refers particularly pertains to the kingdom gospel. To understand the faith expected in Daniel's 70th week, one should consider the gospel of the kingdom. Preached during the ministry of Christ as it is this gospel that will again be preached. Simply put, a kingdom is the domain of a king. However, this particular kingdom, yet future, was the subject emphasized during the life and ministry of the Lord Jesus Christ. The glad tidings of the kingdom included news that the kingdom was at hand and that men should repent and believe to enter it, Mark 1, 14-15. The gospel message incorporated men's responsibilities and the ensuing benefits of their obedience, Matthew 5, 1-48. The tidings introduced the nature of this kingdom by ascribing its likeness to earthly events and practices, Matthew 13, 1-52, Matthew 18, 23 to 35, Matthew 20, 1 to 16, Matthew 22, 2 to 14, Matthew 25, 1 to 30, and the message was confirmed by signs, wonders, and the healing of all manner of sickness and all manner of disease, Matthew 4, 23, Matthew 9, 35, Luke 9, 2. God's attention will again return to the Jewish people following the church's departure. As such, the Lord will once again call and empower some Jewish messengers, for instance, consider. Consider the 144,000 see Revelation chapter 7, and the two witnesses see Revelation chapter 11. These Jewish messengers will again boldly proclaim this message concerning the coming kingdom and the rule of its rightful king. Unlike the first century limitations, the audience will be indiscriminate both geographically, in all the world, and nationally, unto all nations. Matthew 24, 14 And this gospel of the kingdom shall be preached in all the world for a witness unto all nations, and then shall the end come. Mark 13, 10 And the gospel must first be published among all nations. To those who pay close attention to the context and verb tense, it is obvious that the promise of Matthew 24, 14 and Mark 13, 10 is prophetic or futuristic in nature. The Bible says that the gospel of the kingdom must first be published or shall be preached before the end comes. In other words, the worldwide proclamation of the gospel of the kingdom was and still is a future event. The same point does not hold. True concerning the gospel of the grace of God. According to the scripture, the gospel that Paul expounded, the gospel of the grace of God, was already preached in all the world and to every creature which is under heaven before the canon of scripture was fully penned in the first century. Colossians 1, 5, the gospel, 6 which is come unto you, as it is in all the world, and bringeth forth fruit, as it doth also in you, since the day ye heard of it, and knew the grace of God in truth, Colossians 1, 23 If ye continue in the faith grounded and settled, and be not moved away from the hope of the gospel, which ye have heard, and which was preached to every creature which is under heaven, whereof I Paul am made a minister, those who fail to esteem the truths taught in. God's word might miss or even dismiss this distinction but most assuredly these truths were important enough to be included in the Bible. Furthermore, those who dismiss this crucial distinction create for themselves a contradiction in God's word. Paul wrote that the gospel that he preached had gone into all the world during his ministry, Colossians 1, 5-6, and yet Matthew wrote that when this happens, the end shall come. Matthew 24, 14 And this gospel of the kingdom shall be preached in all the world for a witness unto all nations, and then shall the end come.
Since the end did not come in Paul's day, this would mean one of two things. The Bible contains contradictions or Paul and Matthew were referring to two distinct Gospels. If the Gospel preached by Paul equaled the Gospel of the Kingdom, the end would or should have come in Paul's day. It did not, and God cannot lie. 1 John 3, 20 For if our heart condemn us, God is greater than our heart, and knoweth all things. Titus 1, 2 In hope of eternal life, which God, that cannot lie, promised before the world began. In the context, the end, Matthew 24, 14, is identified as the time of the Lord's coming, and of the end of the world, Matthew 24, 3. This is another reason why rightly dividing the scriptures is so important, 2 Timothy 2, 15. The end in Matthew chapter 24 is not the blessed hope or the rapture of the church. In fact, it is important to note that the rapture is not on hold, as some teach, awaiting the evangelism of some remote heathen. Nothing apart from the Father's timing stands between the Lord Jesus Christ and his return to the clouds to meet the New Testament church. Ultimately, the Bible student must understand that the church is not Israel, the gospel of the kingdom is not the gospel of the grace of God, the end of the world is not the rapture of the church, Matthew chapter 24 is not a parallel passage for 1 Thessalonians chapter 4 or 1 Corinthians chapter 15. Yet, far too few can articulate these differences because they do not rightly divide. While it is true that the death, burial, and resurrection was not a part of the gospel of the kingdom during the ministry of Christ, it must be remembered that the crucifixion of Christ was yet future when this gospel was first preached. From the moment Christ died and rose again, the truth of his resurrection has been a vital part of any message preached. Those who would disregard Christ's sacrifice in Revelation should consider what the blood of Christ means to all post, Calvary. Revelation 12, 11 And they overcame him by the blood of the Lamb, and by the word of their testimony, and they loved not their lives unto the death. It stands to reason that the preaching of the gospel of the kingdom in the future will be reinforced by the good news of Christ's offering for sins. To this truth, the scriptures agree. After all, the dragon will persecute the remnant of Israel which have the testimony of Jesus Christ, Revelation 12, 17 and the faith of Jesus, Revelation 14, 12, and when they are put to death, they are identified as the martyrs of Jesus, Revelation 17, 6. This certainly sounds quite different from the Jewish nation prior to the crucifixion. 4. The absence of faith if you envision a world without a single saved person left on earth, this gives you some concept of the spiritual and moral depravity taking place at the commencement of Daniel's 70th week. Deception, fear, hatred, and every manner of immorality will be on the rise, while love, hope, and peace will be hard to find. The conditions will worsen so badly that the Savior asked, When the Son of Man cometh, shall he find faith on the earth? Luke 18, 8 From the onset of Daniel's 70th week, men will be plagued with the threat of deception, particularly as it applies to a false covenant and false prophets. After all, the one who is a liar, and the father of it, John 8, 44, will have his share of false prophets doing his bidding. Even prior to the midpoint and the abomination of desolation, Satan must create doubt as to the identity and location of the Son of God. The false gospel is basically threefold. I am Christ, Matthew 24, 5, Mark 13, 6, Luke 21, 8, the time draw it near, Luke 21, 8, and follow me noted by the admonition, go ye not therefore after them, Luke 21, 8. Whether or not the deceptive satanic messengers bark out threatenings when their appeals are refused is not necessarily known, but what is known is that their appeals result in a high rate of success. After all, the Bible says that many will come in Christ's name and they will effectively deceive many. In this capacity, these messengers, or antichrists, pave the way for the final antichrist to follow, 1 John 2, 18. God also warned that during Daniel's 70th week, 
the hordes of hell will implement signs and wonders attempting to draw away the elect, believing Israel, Matthew 24, 24, Mark 13, 22. If this heightened deception were not sufficiently precarious, between Christ's return for the church and his return to earth to establish his kingdom, there will be an outpouring of hatred. Hatred unseen since the days of Noah. This makes sense seeing that the less that man understands and knows God, the less he comprehends love. 1 John 4, 20 Few people will be able to be trusted, whether friend or foe, family or stranger, religious or abject heathen. God's people will first experience the dire threats originating from without before turning against each other. Darwinian philosophies rule the day and many Jews will further forsake the religion of their father's God and adopt the philosophy of survival of the fittest. The contrast taking place between truth and error is a major difference between man, made humanism and biblical religion. Humanism says love thyself first, yet biblical religion says love others first and love them always above oneself. The Jews will witness their loved ones cast into prisons only to be brought before the rulers of these nations. The Jews will be afflicted and beaten with many killed. As the Jews see their loved ones delivered for interrogation to the councils and synagogues, they become overwhelmed by the resultant fear. Unfortunately, many of the Jews will not withstand the onslaught and eventually turn upon each other, Matthew 24, 9, Mark 13, 9, Luke 21, 12. Fear of the unknown frequently motivates men to stoop to unfathomable lows. Due to the threats made by the nations and kingdoms during Daniel's 70th week, the Jews will grow increasingly apprehensive. As a result, they will take extreme measures to protect themselves. These defensive maneuvers will progressively decline in morality. They begin with personal offenses before spiraling into a complete betrayal and hatred for those of their own families. Matthew 24 10. The threats that started from without will now deprive families and communities of any peace even within their once protected environments. This environment will lead to a betrayal with no one immune. This betrayal will include friends but eventually extends to both distant and immediate family members. Mark 13, 12, Luke 21, 16. For those who find this scenario impossible to accept or believe, consider the circumstances surrounding the early church. The Apostle Paul, an unsaved Pharisee named Saul at the time, removed men and women from their homes, compelling them to blaspheme or die, Acts 8, 3, Acts 26, 10-11. Why? Simply because of Saul's intense hatred for those Jews who had trusted Christ. This same type of division seems to appear during Daniel's 70th week. After all, the Lord Jesus offered the following context stating all this was for my Jesus' name's sake, Matthew 24, 9, Luke 21, 12. Since the church is gone, this necessitates that some Jews will proclaim the name of Christ. Any outward acknowledgement of the truth becomes increasingly dangerous and deadly. The desire for alternatives reaches an all-time high. As demand for false truths arise, the devil has a sufficient supply of false teachers at his disposal. Many Jewish people will choose to reject Christ and reject the message of the forthcoming judgment. Instead, they will be looking for alternatives to this impending calamity. The devil will happily oblige them with such falsehoods and deception especially in the spiritual realm, Matthew 24, 11. Truth and righteousness are inseparable. As lies supplant truth, Iniquity replaces righteousness. Unfortunately, no one controls how far things spiral out of control. As iniquity abounds and escalates, love simply dies or waxes cold and indifferent. Matthew 24, 12. Man has not witnessed a time, on a worldwide scale, when no semblance of love existed outside a small remnant that is, since before Noah's flood. Genesis 6, 5. Noah's day was and the future will be a time destitute of love which may seem unfathomable and even unimaginable to Christians today. We simply find it hard to conceive a time when the masses will gladly betray one another to death without remorse. Some perspective would help. 
No matter how bad things get concerning the sanctity of life before the rapture, with abortions or murder as it stands in God's eyes, sinicide, gerontocide, assisted suicides, etc. Christians today still impact many societies. Imagine a future world without any Christian influence a world where hearts have grown so cold there is no love that's Daniel's 70th week. As love waxes cold, life is no longer precious and loses its significance. People's consciences will be seared. Isaiah offered a vivid description of these future times when he said, I the Lord will make a man more precious than fine gold, even a man than the golden wedge of Ophir, Isaiah 13, 12. As man continues to devalue human life, murder, and other deviant criminal activities escalate out of control. The taking of life will be commonplace and easily justifiable in these last days. Again, no wonder Jesus asked, When the Son of Man cometh, shall he find faith on the earth? Luke 18, 8. 5. Salvation Dispensational Salvation Unfortunately, this is where many well meaning saints will immediately go to Matthew 24, 13 and suggest that believers in the tribulation must endure unto the end to garner or maintain their soul's salvation. However, the salvation aid mentioned simply refers to physical salvation and preservation of one's life. Those who physically endure without taking the mark of the beast are ultimately physically delivered to enter physically into the millennium. In other words, those who want to enjoy kingdom life must mix their faith with good works by enduring to the end. Always ask yourself from what the person is being saved and unto what is the person being saved. Today, spiritual salvation refers to being saved from sin unto righteousness. After the rapture, many of the references refer to being saved from physical death so the individual can survive and enter the millennial kingdom alive. The sad truth is that far too many Bible teachers view saved and salvation in the Bible as always referring to one soul like that found in Acts 4, 12. Yet, the Matthew passage is speaking of physical elements enduring physically and being physically saved. The widespread incorrect application of this verse has led to some questionable teachings and unfortunate contradictions. The context proving the type of salvation is plainly given in Matthew chapter 24. Mark chapter 13, and Luke chapter 21 This salvation is obviously physical in nature. Jesus refers to a man's flesh, Matthew 24, 22, Mark 13, 20, even including the preservation of the hairs upon one's head, Luke 21, 18. Read the context, Matthew 24, 22 and accept those days should be shortened, there should no flesh be saved but for the elect's sake those days shall be shortened. Mark 13, 20 And except that the Lord had shortened those days, no flesh should be saved, but for the elect's sake, whom he hath chosen, he hath shortened the days. Luke 21, 18 But there shall not an hair of your head perish. Likewise, God's promise to shorten the days, likely the length of a day, involves the preservation of physical life. If those days are not shortened in some fashion, the Bible says that none of the elect, believing Israel, would be able to physically endure to the end. The shorter the days, the more that will be saved, spared physically. Those saving their physical life from a physical death will exit Daniel's 70th week to enjoy the millennial kingdom. It is as simple as that. If this salvation mentioned in the Olivet Discourse referred to a spiritual salvation or birth, which it does not, the shortening of days would produce the opposite outcomes. With less time, fewer would be reached with the message of salvation. The longer time continues, the more people could have an opportunity to be birthed into God's family. The shortening of a day would mean less killing time and less dying time. This passage simply does not refer to a spiritual birth, but it does refer to a physical escape similar to that found in Exodus. 8 Enduring to the end of the 70th week period in the context has nothing to do with being born again or a soul's salvation. It refers to those who refuse the mark of the beast but also flee for their lives day after day, hour by hour, and minute by minute. Three scenarios exist at that time, the Jews endure, or get caught, or give up and give in to the lie. 
King Jesus is preparing to establish his kingdom on earth. Only by the grace of God will an individual of the Jewish nation make it alive through that week of years. If a person does not trust in the Lord, he will fail to enjoy the blessings of going into the kingdom. Exodus, the picture of physical salvation The Bible says that history repeats itself. The story in Exodus of the Exodus from Egypt reveals many similarities to what will take place with the Jews in Daniel's 70th week. Ecclesiastes 3, 15 That which hath been is now, and that which is to be hath already been, and God requireth that which is past. The book of Exodus offers an example of those who were physically spared. Interestingly, the judgment involved smiting the land of Egypt and the gods of Egypt not the people of Egypt or of Israel. Exodus 12, 12-13 Those who were destroyed in Egypt died because there was no blood on the doorpost. Those who escaped Egypt were redeemed from bondage because of God by His grace, His mercy, and His power He delivered those who put their faith and trust in the Word of God. The exodus from Egypt was a physical deliverance of an earthly people from an earthly bondage to go to a piece of earth and live there on the earth in the land. Sounds familiar. There was no heaven or paradise in view. Again, this parallel example refers to a physical people receiving physical deliverance to go into a physical land. Additionally, the law was given to them so that they could live long in the land. Exodus 20, 12 Honor thy father and thy mother, that thy days may be long upon the land which the Lord thy God giveth thee. The Ten Commandments were given to Israel so that they could live long on the land. This people had already been redeemed in Exodus chapter 12. The law was not given to them to bring them out of bondage because they had already been brought out of Egyptian bondage. What happened to those who disobeyed the commandments? They died in wilderness so much for a long life in the land. Simply believing the Bible proves these truths. 1 Corinthians chapter 10 explains the scenario mentioning the wilderness cloud covering and the Red Sea crossing with the baptism that took place. 1 Corinthians 10, 1 Moreover, brethren, I would not that ye should be ignorant, how that all our fathers were under the cloud, and all passed through the sea, two and were all baptized unto Moses in the cloud and in the sea, three and did all eat the same spiritual meat, four and did all drink the same spiritual drink, for they drank of that spiritual rock that followed them, and that rock was Christ. Spiritually they all drank, they were all delivered, they were all baptized in the sea. Yet the passage continues by explaining that many of them did not make it into the promised land, think future millennium. 1 Corinthians 10, 5 But with many of them God was not well pleased, for they were overthrown in the wilderness. Who were these people that were overthrown in the wilderness? They were under the blood of the Passover, redeemed by grace from Egypt, spiritually ate and drank, spiritually were baptized. Yet, they died in the wilderness for reasons defined in 1 Corinthians 10, 6-10, verse 6 they lusted after evil things. Verse 7 they were idolaters. Verse 8 they committed fornication. Verse 9 they tempted Christ. Verse 10 they murmured. They had something spiritual that they got in a moment of time when they believed God but their past did not make them fit to live in his earthly kingdom the promised land. One element was by grace escaping Egypt, and one was by works living in the kingdom. Daniel's 70th week exhibits these same truths. When they put the blood on the doorposts on Passover night, they did it because they believed God. They believed it was a way to escape. However, when the Pharaoh came to his senses, what would have happened to any of those Israelites who chose to stay in Egypt after being delivered by the blood on Passover night? They would have died because they did not. Get out of Egypt. God told them to be ready to flee just as he warns those in Daniel's 70th week. They were to eat the Passover dressed and ready to flee. Exodus 12, 11 And thus shall ye eat it, with your loins girded, your shoes on your feet, and your staff in your hand and ye shall eat it in haste, it is the Lord's Passover. They are to flee and focus on one thing escape. Concerning Daniel's 70th week, the following warning is issued concerning their physical survival. Matthew 24, 
15 When ye therefore shall see the abomination of desolation, spoken of by Daniel the prophet, stand in the holy place, whoso readeth, let him understand, 16 Then let them which be in Judea flee into the mountains, 17 Let him which is on the housetop not come down to take anything out of his house, 18 Neither let him which is in the field return back to take his clothes. They are not to allow any hindrances or distractions hold them back like those who have a baby in their arms. Why? It is harder to run away from the physical persecution. Matthew 24, 19 And woe unto them that are with child, and to them that give suck in those days. They are warned concerning the time of year or time of the month. Why? It is harder to flee and hide in the wintry months and commerce and transportation shuts down for the Sabbath. Matthew 24, 20 But pray ye that your flight be not in the winter, neither on the Sabbath day, this is the context of enduring to the end, of what? The great tribulation coming upon the earth. It is not enduring to the end of one's life. Matthew 24, 21 For then shall be great tribulation, such as was not since the beginning of the world to this time, no, nor ever shall be. The context of enduring to the end refers to when Christ sets up his kingdom, verse 3, not enduring to the end of one's life. Here is the context of Matthew chapter 24. Verse 3 The end of the world verse 6 The end is not yet verse 13 Endure to the end of what? Not one's life context is the end of the world. The context is salvation of the flesh from physical death. It is not the salvation of the soul from sin. Christ in Matthew chapter 24 is referring to the end of this world system and the end of all this wickedness, death, and destruction, and the setting of his kingdom. Think about it. Moses disobeyed God and his disobedience made him unfit to live in the kingdom. Yet, he was still fit to live in glory because of the grace of God given to him when he believed God. We know that Moses died in faith and went to paradise, Hebrews 11, 24-29. We also know that the people got out of that land by grace, into the land by grace. Out of Egypt by grace, into Canaan by grace. Those making it through the tribulation will only make it by grace. Endure unto the end the result of this physical salvation, for those who endure unto the end of Daniel's 70th week, is entrance into an earthly kingdom, the millennium, with natural bodies. The word saved describing a physical deliverance is quite common in scripture. In fact, this usage, physical versus spiritual deliverance, is its more frequent application within the entirety of the scripture. Unfortunately, the Bible teachers who read into most references to save or saved as the soul's salvation come to the wrong conclusions. Even the New Testament church believer has two applications of salvation. Each believer experiences a new birth, quickened spirit, redeemed soul, and in the future will experience another salvation, the adoption, or redemption of the body. To understand the latter use of saved and salvation today, here are three points to consider concerning this salvation slash adoption, this adoption involves the redemption of the body. Romans 8, 23 And not only they, but ourselves also, which have the first fruits of the Spirit. Even we ourselves groan within ourselves, waiting for the adoption, to wit, the redemption of our body. This adoption, or salvation, is nearer than when we first believed. Romans 13, 11 And that, knowing the time, that now it is high time to awake out of sleep, for now is our salvation nearer than when we believed. This adoption ushers believers into a heavenly kingdom at death or the rapture. 2 Timothy 4 18 And the Lord shall deliver me from every evil work, and will preserve me unto his heavenly kingdom, to whom be glory for ever and ever. Amen. These truths concerning salvation, redemption, and deliverance apply to the New Testament Christian consummated at the rapture. The Jews, however, are looking to receive an earthly kingdom promised to them as far back as Abraham in Genesis chapter 12. God's promises to Israel were not superseded by the church, nor does the church replace Israel. God's promises to Israel simply will not be thwarted by all the error being taught, nor by the fiery darts of the wicked. God makes many promises for the elect's sake, 
Matthew 24, 22. As noted in the circumstances concerning the judgment of the nations, see Matthew 25, 31 to 46, Jews will be deprived of food, drink, housing, clothing, health care, and freedom. The nations will be rewarded for having provided these things during Daniel's 70th week. Fortunately, God shortened the days to ensure some could and would survive the onslaught from every side. Physical survival during Daniel's 70th week for a Jew and others refusing the mark of the beast will be like running a gauntlet with danger around every corner. The believers will be sandwiched between the wrath of their enemies, the wrath of their friends, and that of their families. Eventually, the wrath of the unholy trinity will rise, followed by the unleashing of the full wrath of Almighty God. Absolutely no one will endure unto the end without God's assistance and supernatural protection. No flesh in its own power will be saved, spared, or preserved. None. With that false interpretation debunked, consider for a moment what it does take for a man to be spiritually saved in Daniel's 70th week. As it was in the past and in the present, any gospel message is only effectual when it is mixed with faith by those that hear it. Hebrews 4, 2 the gospel message preached during Daniel's 70th week is by no means the exception to this rule. For instance, those who believe have the testimony of Jesus Christ, Revelation 12, 17, and the faith of Jesus, Revelation 14, 12. They will have sought first the kingdom of God, Matthew 6, 33, and that kingdom will be within them, Luke 17, 21, and as a result, they will experience God's supernatural provision for food and raiment, Matthew 6, 25-34, through the nations, Matthew 25, 34-40, that have believed God's word concerning blessing the Jews, Genesis 12, 3. These truths should sufficiently debunk the generally accepted teaching that those in the tribulation with the best chance of survival, enduring to the end, are the self sufficient with the best hiking gear and the keenest sharp, shooting techniques. God's provision in response to their seeking of his kingdom and his righteousness will mean they will have no need for the mark of the beast, Revelation 13, 16-18, nor to take any thought if called before the judge and jury on what they shall answer. In those situations, the Holy Ghost shall give them the words, Matthew 10, 19-20. Some might disagree with the fact that only the mercy and grace of God will sustain the tribulation saint, but that would make Jesus a liar when he taught such things during his earthly ministry as he prepared the Jews for their kingdom. Even those who died, died because they loved God more than their physical lives. Revelation 12, 11 And they overcame him by the blood of the Lamb, and by the word of their testimony. Testimony, and they loved not their lives unto the death. 6. The closing event the second coming the second coming of Christ is not the rapture of the church. They are two clearly distinguishable events majoring on two different people groups separated by seven years. The rapture, or blessed hope as it is also known, involves Christ's coming for the church where all believers meet him in the clouds. He does not set foot upon the earth. Instead, he calls up the church age believers to meet him in the air. 1 Thessalonians 4, 13-18 Conversely, the second coming of Christ to earth involves Christ's coming to deliver believing Israel from the hand of Satan and usher those who endure to the end of the tribulation into his promised kingdom. This coming requires that he come to the earth to judge and to make war with his enemies, Zechariah 14, 1-7. As it is with the previous ages, the closing event of this age will serve as God's correction and restoration in response to man's failure within the age. This one major event will encompass Encompass several distinguishable events in sequential order, the brightness of the sun will be magnified seven times, Isaiah 30, 26, the Son of Man will appear, Mark 13, 26, Luke 21, 27, all the tribes of the earth mourn, Matthew 24, 30, a great trumpet will sound, Matthew 24, 31, Christ will send his angels to gather the elect for protection, Matthew 24, 31, 
Christ will come to earth from heaven to execute judgment upon the enemies of Israel, Revelation 19, 11, 13, 15 to 16, the armies which were in heaven follow Christ to earth, Revelation 19, 14, and an angel stands in the sun, inviting the fowls of the air to gather for the supper of the great God, Revelation 19, 17 to 18. While Christ's coming is a fearful time for the enemies of the Lord, it serves as a time of great rejoicing and relief for the believing Jews. Those who had been scattered by God all over the earth will be gathered by his angels just prior to Christ and his armies arriving to the earth. Those persecuted will be protected and preserved. Those accused and attacked by Satan will be redeemed and secured in Jesus. Jacob's testimony that once was all these things are against me, Genesis. Genesis 42, 36, will become if God be for us, who can be against us? Romans 8, 31. To illustrate the nature and happenings of the second coming, Luke 17, 30, God provided two Old Testament characters and their respective deliverances, Noah, Luke 17, 26 to 27, and Lot, Luke 17, 28 to 29. In both the days of Lot and the days of Noah, the wicked were taken in judgment, death, and the righteous were preserved on the earth and delivered safely from the judgment upon the wicked. In both cases, the Lord offered the man and his family protection from the onslaught of God's wrath to be poured out. In fact, angels were sent from God to physically protect Lot and his family from harm's way. At Christ's second coming, this too will be the work of the angels. The angels will gather the elect, the day of the Lord will begin with judgment, wrath darkness, etc. This one point alone clearly demonstrates a significant difference between the rapture of the church and the second coming. It is startling to the Bible believer. At the rapture of the church, being left behind promises heartache, sorrow, troubles, trials, temptations, fear, and, for many, certain. Certain damnation. At the second coming, however, those left behind will be overjoyed at the abundance of blessings received as they enter into Christ's earthly, millennial kingdom. In Daniel's 70th week, people will multiply their pleasures and riches, and as a result, the cares of this world will likewise multiply. Men will become less concerned with their true surroundings and circumstances. Yet, the Lord admonished the Jews that their hearts could be overcharged with surfeiting, and drunkenness, and cares of this life, Luke 21, 34. Those who drop their guard will find that Christ's return will come upon them when they expect it least, Luke 21, 34. The reality concerning the unbelieving world is that as a snare shall it that day come on all them that dwell on the face of the whole earth, Luke 21, 35. It does not have to be that way for the Jews. God has provided a way of escape faith. Considering these basic concerns, the Lord called the Jews to a three-pronged response, 1. Take heed, 2. Watch, and 3. Pray. The admonition to take heed involves personal responsibility or accountability to oneself. The admonition to watch can include the personal call to take heed but extends to being circumspect as to the circumstances of life surrounding all of mankind upon the earth. Lastly, the Lord admonished the people to pray. Heeding and watching is quite useless unless the people seek God's help to thwart the plans of Satan and preserve the believing Jews. The end desire for these Jews is that they will escape all these things that shall come to pass and be left behind to stand before the Son of Man, Luke 21, 36. 8. The Age of the Kingdom, Revelation 20. 1. The opening event the second coming God reveals very little about the age of the kingdom in the book of Revelation. However, one truth holds certain the duration of this kingdom. Six of the ten verses specifically dealing with this age make sure that we understand it encompasses a thousand years, Revelation 20, 2, 3, 4, 5, 6, 7. This thousand year period measures from the time of Christ's second coming to the casting of Satan into the lake of fire and brimstone, Revelation 20, 
10. Christ came as the Lamb of God at his first advent, John 1, 29, 36, meek and lowly. Yet, Christ returns at his second advent in all his glory with power and majesty and judgment. Unfortunately, because men fail to consider the entirety of scripture, the various elements involved in this advent are missed. For example, Matthew 25, 31 simply says that Christ will come with his holy angels and sit upon his throne, yet, between those two events, the Bible points to a major judgment called the judgment of the nations. Before Christ establishes his millennial kingdom, the Lord will execute judgment upon the nations. Unbelievers will be refused entrance into the kingdom while believing nations hear the joyful words, Come, ye blessed of my Father, inherit the kingdom prepared for you from the foundation of the world, Matthew 25, 34. These nations do not enter the kingdom because of some Calvinistic override of their will, rather, they enter because of their faith in the word and their obedience to the revealed will of God. This judgment corresponds to the prophecy found in Psalm 9. There, David spoke of a time when mine enemies are turned back, they shall fall and perish at thy presence, Psalm 9, 3. He acknowledged that the Lord sateth in the throne judging right, Psalm 9, 4. He saw that the Lord rebuked the heathen, destroyed the wicked, put out their name forever and ever, Psalm 9, 5. Additionally, David wrote that God prepared his throne for judgment, Psalm 9, 7, and that God would judge the world in righteousness and minister judgment to the people in uprightness, Psalm 9, 8. In closing, David understood that the wicked shall be turned into hell, and all the nations that forget. God, Psalm 9, 17. In fact, the fruition of the judgment is an answer to David's prayer found in the concluding remarks of the psalm, Psalm 9, 19 Arise, O Lord, let not man prevail, let the heathen be judged in thy sight. 20 Put them in fear, O Lord, that the nations may know themselves to be but men. Selah. Yet, there are those who reduce the final judgments into one single judgment. Here are significant differences between the three end, time judgments, 1, the judgment seat of Christ, 2, the great white throne judgment, and, 3, the judgment of the nations. The judgment seat of Christ, a judgment in heaven involving only the saved, should not be confused with the great white throne judgment a judgment where the unsaved are raised from the dead only to receive their final sentence condemnation into the lake of fire. The third which involves the particular judgment in our present study is a national judgment. When the nations appear before the Lord, he divides them into two distinct categories, sheep and goats, and he will do so as a shepherd divides the flock, Matthew 25, 32-33. Unfortunately, the Western mind, set in culture finds it odd that shepherds often kept sheep and goats together, but both were of the flock, see Leviticus 3, 6, 7, 12. Another misnomer in not understanding the culture is that we often fail to recognize that shepherding entails much more than simply being a herder of the sheep. For instance, sheep and goats frequently display a striking resemblance to each other. Only those familiar with shepherding could easily distinguish between the two. The shepherd knows that the most distinguishable characteristic between the animals involves behavior sheep tend to follow, and goats tend to go their own way. When the Lord divides the nations, he places the sheep nations on his right hand and the goat nations on his left. The sheep nations are those who followed the word of God and treated Israel appropriately during Daniel's 70th week. The goat nations are those who went their own way and turned against God's chosen people. Once the division is completed, the shepherd's work is done, and the nations are staring. Staring into the face of the king. The Bible says, Then shall the king say. As the shepherd, Christ will separate using his knowledge of the differences between the sheep and the goats. Now as king, he executes his rightful authority to judge. The foundation of this judgment will involve a trans-dispensational truth treat Israel right and be blessed, treat Israel wrong and suffer the consequences. Thousands of years ago, the Lord told Abraham, I will bless them that bless thee, 
and curse him that curseth thee. Genesis 12, 3. That Bible truth will be the required object of faith to pass the test of the judgment of the nations. Those who followed the Lord in obedience are the sheep who inherit the kingdom. Those who do not abide by this admonition are the goats that will experience the ultimate curse. The reality is that Daniel's 70th week will cause the Jews to be hungry, thirsty, naked, sick, and imprisoned. Those nations in direct opposition to the New World Order will adopt a pro-Jewish policy. At the judgment of the nations, they will find their reward far superior to any temporary hardships experienced. The Jews will also be faced with a judgment at this time. This judgment is described in Ezekiel 20, 34-38. At this judgment, the Lord will plead with the Jews face, to, face, Ezekiel 20, 35-36, and the timing is clear I will bring you out from the people, and will gather you out of the countries wherein yet are scattered, Ezekiel 20, 34. Those who are found to be rebels will be purged, Ezekiel 20, 38, and those who exercised faith in the Lord's revealed truth will be brought into the bond of the covenant, Ezekiel 20. 37, see Romans 11, 26 to 27, and will be taken into the land. 2. Dispensational continuity Everything promised to Abraham, Isaac, and Jacob will be fulfilled in this age. All the preparatory work of John the Baptist, the Lord Jesus Christ, and the apostles will come to fruition. The promises of the Apostle Paul and others to faithful church age saints concerning rewards and ruling will be realized. In a sense, it could be said that the age of the kingdom is the fulfillment of all previous ages. As such, much of the continuity will be the realization of things promised in previous times. John the Baptist's preaching offers the best example of what will be preached in Daniel's 70th week. He said to prepare yourself by your works for the coming of the king and the establishment of the kingdom. Yet, he first pronounced, Behold the Lamb of God that taketh away the sin of the world, John 1, 29. You must accept the Lamb and then get your works right if you want to be a part of that kingdom. If you want to physically live following the abomination of desolation, do not stick around Jerusalem. Get out of town if you want to live in the kingdom. Salvation of the body is of works by trusting in the one that can deliver. 3. The necessity of faith Some have supposed that because Christ will be present on earth, there will be no need of faith. Yet, the Lord had previously been on the earth and physically accessible to his people, moreover, he had to consistently challenge them to exercise faith. At this point, it would probably be a good reminder that in addition to resurrected Jews and church-age saints, there will be others who enter the millennial kingdom in natural bodies. As part of the millennial kingdom, the mortal inhabitants will be called upon to go up from year to year to worship the King, the Lord of hosts, and to keep the Feast of Tabernacles, Zechariah 14, 16. Those who believe the Lord will demonstrate their faith through their obedience, but some will refuse. Since man's very beginning, it has been impossible to please God without faith and that will not change just because King Jesus is seated on a throne in Jerusalem, Hebrews 11, 6. In the kingdom age, the mountain of the Lord's house shall be established in the top of the mountains, and all nations shall flow unto it. Isaiah 2, 2. At that time, many people shall go and say, Come yet, and let us go up, to the house of the God of Jacob, and he will teach us of his ways, and we will walk in his paths, for out of Zion shall go forth the law, and the word of the Lord from Jerusalem. Isaiah 2, 3. As is true in every age, a message preached or taught must be believed. The incarnate Savior required faith at his first advent and will require nothing less when he returns as the king establishing his kingdom. 4. The absence of faith the righteous entering the kingdom from Daniel's 70th week will do so in natural bodies. Over the course of the 1000 years, those with natural bodies will have children and will multiply the population of the earth. Jeremiah 30, 19-22, Ezekiel 47, 22. 
Life expectancy will only be shortened by faithless disobedience and there will be no more than an infant of days. Isaiah 65, 20 Those who enter the kingdom in righteousness will be brought into the covenant, but their offspring are not born into those conditions. The kingdom will be governed by strict rules, see Matthew chapters 5 through 7, and the consequences for disobedience will be swift, Zechariah 14, 16 to 19, and stern, Psalm 2, 7 to 9. Yet, all of this proves that there will be sin in the kingdom and sin only exists where there are sinners. God has never been interested in men serving and loving him by being forced or given no choice. As such, these who newly populate and live during the kingdom will be faced by the choice to trust Christ or to rebel against him. At the end of the 1,000 years, Satan will be able to gather, together to battle, the number of whom is as the sand of the sea, Revelation 20, 8. This is the greatest example of a people absent of faith. 5. Salvation It is obvious at the end that a multitude of people will turn against the Lord in unbelief, but as clearly stated there are those who will trust in the Lord. After the kingdom, we are told about the new Jerusalem which has the tree of life whose leaves, were for the healing of the nations, Revelation 22, 2, but that could solely be designated for those who entered the kingdom under the covenant. If nobody is saved from this age, it would be the first to be that way. 6. The closing event Final judgments Several major events mark the conclusion of Christ's millennial kingdom, but one that may go unnoticed is simply the passing of time. Christ promised a 1,000-year kingdom and that kingdom will end when time expires. This is what the scripture indicates when it emphasized, till the thousand years should be fulfilled, Revelation 20, 3. At the end of the allotted time, Satan will be loosed with the goal of deceiving earth's inhabitants. His time will be short, or as the Bible says, a little season, Revelation 20, 3, but his deception gathers a multitude the number of whom is as the sand of the sea, Revelation 20, 8. Satan and his mighty hordes will prove no match for the Lord. Their purpose will be to contend against the Lord and particularly the Lord's people. They will compass the camp of the saints about in the beloved city, Jerusalem, but fire will come down from God out of heaven and devour them, Revelation 20, 9. The captain of their host will receive his just reward and be cast into the lake of fire and brimstone, and shall be tormented day and night forever and ever, Revelation 20, 10. Just as the serpent was first judged in the Garden of Eden, Genesis 3, 14-15, the devil is the first to receive judgment. Shortly thereafter, there will appear a great white throne, the heaven and earth will flee away, Revelation 20, 11, and the dead will be called to stand before God while the books are opened, and men are judged according to their works, Revelation 20, 12-13 Death and hell will be cast into the lake of fire, Revelation 20, 14, followed by all who are not found written in the book of life, Revelation 20, 15. Revelation 20, 15 And whosoever was not found written in the book of life was cast into the lake of fire.